The Athletic. The race is on, and Lando Norris finally claimed his maiden Grand Prix victory as McLaren took its first win since 2021 in the Miami Grand Prix. And while luck played its part, so did serious pace. But where did McLaren's renewed turn of speed come from, and why couldn't Max Verstappen do anything about it? I'm Ed Shaw, and joining us to reveal all are Mark Hughes and Scott mitchell Mao. Well, Scott, how's Miami been? Plenty of celebrities around? Any iguanas falling out of trees, that kind of thing? No iguanas falling out of trees, and you'll be... You'll be saddened to hear, Ed, that at the third attempt of the Miami Grand Prix, I'm yet to see an alligator. So that's obviously... Oh, do you remember, we were very disappointed in the first year, weren't we? We really thought they would just be... They'd, we thought they'd be ubiquitous. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit disappointing, especially because the house we had that first year basically backed onto a lake with alligators. So it's doubly disappointing. <laughs> yeah. And the and the track is right next to a massive creek as well. So we, 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 I, was, I was optimistic. But no, it's, um, it's, it's been good to be back. I... Um, I have to admit, I think I said this before, years one to two, the race improved massively here um, and the experience improved massively. Um, I'm still a bit too pale, pasty English and moved to an even colder uh, cold country than England, so I really hate the sun. Um, so I've been badly burned because I'm terrible at sunscreen. Uh, but it's been a good week. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> and Mark Hughes, how's it been for you? You don't look sunburnt, at least. Um, no, I'm, I'm quite happy in the, in the sun. Um my dog uh, is happy in the sun and sort of lies upside down in the, in the garden. And um, I, I sort of feel an affinity with him when it would, you know, it's the sort of thing I like to do as, as well, really. But, um, so I'm quite happy in this climate. And uh, yeah, it's been a nice weekend. So have you spent some of it just lying upside down in the paddock, soaking it all in? Yeah, well, it wasn't really time, but you know, given, given a bit more time, and a few less tasks, a few tasks. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd maybe try that. Excellent. Well, that's something to try next time with a less task-heavy uh, weekend. But there's plenty of tasks to get through on this podcast because it was a, a pretty busy Miami Grand Prix weekend. So let's get on with it. And Mark, can you just explain how it all played out for Norris and McLaren and perhaps weigh up how much of this win was good fortune and how much was good performance? Yeah, it, it, it depended a, a, a bit on luck um, with the, the timing of the safety car. And he, he wasn't going to win it without that, probably. Um, and the safety car the, the picking up the, um, the 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 wrong um, the the wrong leader. Uh, the, the sort of everything hung in the balance for a little while. But um, once he got that opportunity, he absolutely nailed it, and he'd already indicated before then that he had some serious pace. The, the, the car was probably the fastest car in the race. Um, but until the safety car, he probably wasn't going to be able to convert that into a victory. Um, I, I fancy him, he'd probably have been second, you know, at, at worst, uh, maybe second, third, something like that. But clearly the fastest car in the race, just um, out of position. And so he'd qualified fifth and um, had gone down to sixth at the start because avoiding the melee that um, Sergio Perez's late breaking had, had caused caused a bit of chaos and uh, so he was out of position so it didn't look anything particularly the prospects didn't look all that outstanding but throughout the weekend the, the, the new the updated McLaren it, it looked incredibly quick in just flashes but everybody was in and out of phase with their performance all weekend there was something odd about the the way the tires were reacting with the surface and nobody really got a proper handle on it and that was also key to the the, the victory because Verstappen and Red Bull really didn't ever nail their the, the, their setup either so that that it was Norris's McLaren was the quickest car in the race, but we're not comparing it to a, a fully odd song, Red Bull and Verstappen. So I think a little bit early to um, to, to say, right, we, we've, we've got a contest on our hands, we've got two equal cars. Um, let's, let's see, but it, it was certainly a, um, a very refreshing um, left-hand turn, if you like, uh, to the, the, the narrative that we've had in the season to date. Was there any surprise by how comfortable it was for Norris after that restart. It was always on the cards that he could stay ahead, but he won that relatively easily from there. Yeah, he did. And um, he just, once in clear air, he just was able to demonstrate that pace. And he was, um, 
just way quicker through sector one and you just piled on two or three tenths every every lap after the restart to just pull effortlessly away and, and Verstappen recognised as much after a couple of laps and just settled for second place and um, yeah the the big loss was at turn one it was, it was almost uh, almost two tenths at turn one and there's a little bit of d d debate about whether the um, the Red Bull was damaged. Um, Christian Horner afterwards said there was quite a lot of bodywork damage. They assumed it was from him running over the the, the, the bollard. Um, but Max said no, he, he didn't feel that the car was any different after that and um, he was able to do the same lap time. So a little bit of um, debate about that and, and, and sort of, uh, I guess, a little bit of uh, looking at the, the data from the team once they get back. But, uh, yeah, it... it 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 wasn't a fully fit Red Bull, but it was still a Red Bull that managed to defeat the Ferraris. So, I think um, the the signs are certainly hugely promising for McLaren. But um, let's 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 give it a a few races to see where we really are. Yeah, it seemed to be another one of those very positive McLaren upgrades. That much was very clear. But Scott, we should talk about. Norris's win because it was always a question of when rather than if he would win his first Grand Prix but how significant is this breakthrough win at the 110th start? It is significant um, it's a weight off his shoulders he's admitted that um, I think it's also a bit of a pressure relief for McLaren as well because as Andreas Stella put it when I spoke to him after the race um, they, they've been under pressure to provide Norris with this car and obviously this time 12 months ago at this very race it, it didn't look like they were <laughs> they looked like they were further away from providing Norris with that kind of car than at any other point um in his McLaren career so um it, it's 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 huge um for for both parties for for that reason it obviously draws a line under the um Norris is a choke artist narrative who who can't deliver on um on, on that race win in, in crunch moments and he actually did a um, he did a brilliant takedown of that um, in the post-race press conference. Just talked about. He says he um, he has spent a, quite a bit of time um, sarcastically liking comments on his Instagram criticizing him, and he's clocked the Lando No Win No Wins um, nickname that is uh, uh, thrown around as a, as an insult. And he said it put an even bigger smile on his face now to have proven those people wrong. But uh, but I asked him in the in the post-race press conference like, sincerely between Sochi and now. Do you see any opportunities that you've missed to to have done this? And the one he picks out is the Qatar sprint race. That's the only thing he feels where he left let any kind of victory slip. He he knows that he's missed out on poles. He knows that he's probably cost himself a podium here and there. So he he hasn't been perfect since Sochi. He's not saying that. We're not saying that. But he's he's. I don't think he's ever thrown away a golden opportunity to win a Grand Prix. And actually, if seven Grand Prix over the last twelve months had gone just fractionally different, and Verstappen had got tripped up, uh, Norris would be a race winner already so yeah if you if you if you just trace it all back to to Sochi and the great misunderstanding of why that race unraveled which I did ask Stella about um this evening that was a turning point that was a point at which Norris proved he could win a Grand Prix McLaren learned what it took to to to, to win a Grand Prix in that period because obviously it had scored victory with Daniel Ricciardo the previous uh, race at Monza but showed it didn't quite come easy since then they've just been waiting for the opportunity for all the stars to align and, and do the job McLaren has produced the car. McLaren nailed it today. They got a little bit lucky. Norris was excellent. It's fully deserved. And of course, the first win as team principal for Andrea Stella. He's won plenty of races in various engineering roles. But obviously, Mark, Andrea Stella's been hugely influential at that team. And while it's probably most significant for a Norris first win, also the first win for an Andrea Stella team feels quite important because he's just, I mean, he's always been convincing, but he's just increasingly convincing in his leadership of that team with, with every step. Yeah, and everything he says, um, you can follow the logic and um, it, it fits in with a philosophy. And I get the feeling that it's not going to be the, the, the last win that he oversees there. And uh, he's very good, not just technically, but also with with people. And I think the he has got everything sort of aligning very, very well. Um, I think he's going to turn out to be one of the the real top team principals in in in, in the sports history. Yeah, he's a great communicator, very compelling speaker, and very convincing in the way he lays out his arguments. Just really impressive character. 
he's very sincere and he um he has a an idea of the right way to do things as well. He actually cropped up in a very different way over the weekend when he effectively called for Kevin Magnuson to be banned for unsportsmanlike behaviour. He's he, he has a firm belief in doing things the right way and and the the, the reason I, I I bring that up is because um I don't know if either of you two saw but they um they dedicated the win to Gilles de Ferran because it was his it was this the first it's the first win since obviously he passed away. Um, first win for McLaren. This was his home as well. Yeah, so this was um, this was a big deal for for them. They had um, they've got uh, uh, Andrea was wearing a, a, a pin with Gilles um, helmet on it, and um, they had a they had a the the, the pit board uh, when they did the celebratory photo afterwards. They they put his uh, name and said it was for him on there. I thought that was a mm. nice touch because that's the kind of thing that is very easy to overlook in the emotion of something like Lando's first win and just the euphoria of everything. To 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 have had that in mind, I think that was just yeah. It was, it was just it was just very nice. There's some there's some sincere sentiment and emotion that is not just um, sometimes you do uh, feel that this is all just is all business, but. There's a bit more to it than that. There's a personal touch too. Yeah, it says something about the team. But but just got coming back to Norris, obviously you talked about him showing that he can deliver. There were question marks though after uh, the sprint element of the weekend because he could well have had to sprint pole. The final lap didn't come together, the SQ3 lap. Uh, obviously started to go wrong from pretty early on. So do you read much into into that one or is it just a chance for him to then kind of recover in the second half of the weekend and, and show he can put that behind him because he couldn't have done anything about the start of the sprint race that uh, that brought it to a premature end for him. What I like about that is that I, I, maybe a couple of details would be different, but you could have posed that exact question to me in China. That like with like obviously he did the did a great job in, in China in, in, in qualifying in the sprint, then he didn't convert that in 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 the sprint race and that was another case of people criticizing him he doesn't you know he, he doesn't get the job done he, he chokes under pressure and, and all of this and what did Lando do 24 hours later punched in an absolutely superb performance and yeah to a greater or lesser extent history repeated itself here I mean sprint sprint qualifying on the Friday was was strange like I mean to be fair qualifying for the main race <laughs> was also quite strange on Saturday but the, the, the swings in performance run to run that Almost every team and every driver seemed to be complaining about that. That was evident in sprint qualifying as well, and 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 Lando just didn't do a good enough job. Basically, on on Friday, he did a better job in qualifying for for the main race. Um, that was just a case of the yeah the limitation of um, where he felt and McLaren felt the car was over one lap. But um, yeah, he didn't um, he didn't cover himself in glory in the sprint. Obviously, he was he wasn't to blame for his exit at the start of the race, but he. He shouldn't have been there if he should have uh, qualified further ahead. And a quick word, Mark, for Oscar Piastri. Obviously, he had a partial upgrade, but certainly not the the full upgrade and had a, a fairly fraught race uh, in the end with that that contact with Carlos Sainz ultimately ruining it for him. Yeah, he made that um, brilliant opportunistic start where he took advantage of the, the confusion caused by Perez. Um, and uh, they put a nice clean pass on Leclerc to go in second place and held the gap to Verstappen at about three seconds. So it was all panning out quite nicely for him. Uh, the car is, you know, a couple of tenths slower than the upgraded one. Um, I think he was, you think he was doing a really solid job. Uh, and then um, it, it, it just went wrong with the timing of his stops. He, he, he was sort of in a um, a little bit of a an undercut battle with the Ferraris, and uh, he came in. And uh, not long after that, we got the um, the BSC and the safety car, so that sort of swapped them around. That that that, that swapped the two McLarens around essentially, and uh, that was much better because then we had the the faster McLaren, the developed McLaren um, ahead. So uh, yeah, but I think uh, Oscar did a great job. He was um, he, probably a little bit optimistic in some of his. Uh, defensive moves uh, l- later on as he as he tr- sort of tried to to come back, but um, yeah, I think uh, just a, a slightly messy race, but uh, one that showed a lot of uh, pace and promise. Ed, can I ask you a question about uh, the Norris win? If you like, give it a go. Yeah, I would like to. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Are you um, I, I, at, the, at the risk of uh, opening a, a can of worms here in terms of uh, hinting at bias or anything like that? Are you disappointed to have missed it on site? Because obviously we've covered 
Lando for a long time. And actually, I was well, wait, while I was wait, hanging around waiting for Stella's like constantly delayed media session, I actually dug up. I found the very first um, the very first uh, article I wrote about him, which was um, eleven years ago. Uh, when he was stepping into car racing as a world karting champion, European and world karting champion. Um, and obviously we've spoken to him loads and he's someone I, I think, and I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast will understand this. I think he's someone that you've had, uh, got a lot of appreciation for his understanding of the craft and devotion to, to the craft of driving and how much he sort of cares and talks about it. And um, obviously you've spent quite a long time uh, trying to, tell people and we've had lots of conversations about how annoying it is that um, people think he is this I'm using it for the third time on this podcast but a choke artist um, so yeah any disappointment that you weren't there to see it in, in person and, and, and hear from him and Stella yourself not massive I mean I'm, al- I'm always I always like drivers getting their first wins whoever they are really um, so from that from that just perspective a cool, it's just a, a cool thing yeah, to be a part of isn't exactly, it exactly yeah it, 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 in many ways it, it would have been interesting to see that that kind of moment when it all came together because yeah as you say I've followed his uh, progress closely I must admit when he first came into F1 I wasn't super convinced uh, by him but it quite quickly became clear there's quite a lot going on there with Lando Norris the way he thinks the way he approaches things and you start to see signs of that in fact I remember his first FP1 session at Spa I was watching up at Lake Com trackside and I was really impressed with the way he drove he was really grabbing the car sort of by the scruff of the neck, whereas Stoffel van Dorn, the regular driver, was really contained by it. And you've just seen him continue to to build from that. So, yeah, I mean, always it's good to be there for, uh, for drivers' first wins. But I know people don't believe it, but actually I, I just like seeing... Good drivers do any, well. <laughs> well, I just like to see any, any of the drivers maximizing their potential actually and and you'll know from conversations we have about other sports I'm a little bit weird in my outlook on any kind of sport because I'm not especially partisan maybe the England cricket team is one exception but in terms of uh, things I I generally uh, just sort of enjoy the process and the craft it's a little bit weird but so yeah it it would have been uh, interesting to to see that but so one thing I did want to ask is obviously we've not long ago heard that Carlos Sainz got a five second penalty now, I thought that was quite funny because Carlos Sainz was complaining after the race saying, oh, they don't seem to be giving out penalties. So I had a go. And then, of course, he got the five-second penalty, which did cost him fourth place, actually. Do you think that was a, a fair cop for him? The the way it's um, the way it's been described, um, you can see why the penalty has been dished out. Um, it's, 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 it's essentially that it just it just basically slightly strayed beyond the line of hard but fair and into a... Um, uh, uh, causing a collision, basically, um, and and I was quite interested that the stewards applied some leniency because it should have been a ten second penalty and and a two and two points on his license, I think, but they they admitted they halved it on both counts, um, mitigating circumstances. Being it was a very small error, I'll be honest. If we're going to do that, I'd rather that just gets let go. I don't, I don't. We've talked about this so much on the podcast, haven't we? How many penalties there are and whether there should be. But if you're gonna, if you if you if you're going to apply that logic, I'd, li- I'd like to see that stuff go. What was funny is actually when we were doing Stella's post-race, um, as I said, much delayed post-race debrief, um, Signs actually interrupted it briefly right at the very end because he wanted to um, congratulate Stella um, before he left the circuit. And Stella was, uh, had, it was brilliant timing. Stella was literally being asked at, when Signs interrupted about Piastri's race and the contact with Signs, <laughs> So it was, it was a superb timing. But then Stella, to his credit, basically said he thinks it was pretty much a racing incident. Yeah, well, it looked like that sort of thing. But yeah, well, the, the stewarding is a whole debate. We could go on for hours about that and probably will at a later date. We always date. could. <laughs> exactly. Mark, we should briefly mention Sergio Perez because obviously he made himself a little bit unpopular at the start of the race, showing he hadn't learned from uh, Lewis Hamilton's sprint race start by steaming up the inside at the first corner. <laughs> so close to taking out Max Verstappen. <laughs> yeah, it was like very, very close to a complete disaster for the Red Bull team. They could have been wiped out within seconds of the start, the whole team. Um, but yeah, he got, <laughs> they, they got away with it. Uh, you, yeah, man, you can't blame drivers for this. You know, This, this is um, first first corner of the race, there's opportunity there. Yeah, there's tiny, tiny misjudgment. And um, that's where it, it can go. Uh, it's, you know... Just that, that is just racing, and he didn't have any great pace thereafter. And Lando had to actually back off to avoid um, hitting him as he as he rejoined the track. 
uh, and that sort of defined Lando's first stint. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was not a, not a vintage weekend for Checo, but uh, the car was never quite there, and you know, so I think. Uh, it, it, it was where it was. Uh, he, he got a free second pit stop um, for the when, when when the safety car came because Mercedes had already pitted their drivers, so the, there was no. It was it was a, a no-brainer to to do the second pit stop. In what was otherwise a one-stop race, so he was quite quick on the the medium tyres. But um, yeah, okay, not nothing disastrous really. Before we move down the order, Mark, how about Ferrari? Obviously, Charles Leclerc finished third, Carlos Sainz fifth after being bumped down from fourth by the penalty. A little bit of disappointment that if Red Bull weren't winning, it wasn't them doing the winning. Mm. Maybe there were ways that if the cards had fallen differently, they could have got to the front. But yeah. it's still a pretty pretty much a weekend they were where you'd expect them to be, I guess, overall. They were relative to Red Bull, yes. So they you know, just a little bit, maybe a tenth and a half, two tenths, a drift of, of, of Verstappen. Um, I think Leclerc pulled everything together very impressively in qualifying after he's off in practice. But I don't think he had as good a, uh, a handle on the car for the, uh, for the race as Sainz did. So it was a little bit unfortunate that they, had, they came out of that first corner in the wrong order, if you like. I think if had, had Sainz come out ahead, which... He would have done had it not been for press because he'd out he'd out accelerated Leclerc off the grid. Um, I think he may have been able to offer a challenge to Verstappen, and in the normal running of the race, you know, without the safety cars com- complicating it. So I don't think we saw a, a fully representative um, Ferrari performance because I think uh, Sainz, you know, he's, a couple of times over the radio, he said, "Look, I've got some pace here," you know, which was pretty clearly coded. I mean, can you get him out of the way? Because I think I can chase. Piastri at that time, and but, but uh, they weren't about to do that. There wasn't, you know, you, you, you're not, not about co- about to cause ructions in the team by you know playing that. So yeah, uh, it was it was it was an okay Ferrari performance, but it, it, every everybody's as I said earlier on, everybody's performances were in and out of phase all weekend, so it was, it was quite tricky, and I, I don't think they nailed it, and I, just as Red Bull didn't nail theirs. Scott, moving down the order a bit, RB had its best weekend of the season, a healthy haul of 12 points. Yuki Tsunoda was 7th in the Grand Prix and 8th in the Sprint, but the headline story was Daniel Ricciardo finishing 4th in the Sprint. We can bring in a question from the Race Members Club here, as Jack Aitken asked, was this a good weekend or a bad weekend for Ricciardo? Um, it, was a, it was good Good uh, Friday and Saturday, well, first half of Saturday. It was a weekend of two halves. <laughs> and then after that, the weekend ended. <laughs> Ricardo might as well not have participated in qualifying in the Grand Prix. Yeah, he was the extreme case study of how everybody's performance was in and out. He, he really was extreme, extraordinary grid position for the sprint qualifying and then um, just mediocre for the rest of the weekend. And no particular... Um, obvious reason why he was either quick or, or, or slow uh, so uh, yeah yeah the 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 enigma continues yeah it was um, one of those where once he got the grid position in sprint qualifying you had every confidence he was then again then going to convert that and he was he was very quick all through sprint um sprint qualifying just just seemed to all be working we've talked about this before daniel admits it he's he, he doesn't have that kind of detailed grasp of of you know why things are working for him, why things aren't working for him, what he likes to do, how to do it, that kind of thing. He's he talk he, he's open about this. He's just much more of a sort of seat of the pants kind of driver, improvising, dealing with what he's got. So when it's going good, it's going great, and when it's going bad, um, it then trails away like it did. Like he he was and remains baffled by why he had no pace in qualifying, and then once he had that poor grid position he was basically just going to run around at the back because he had the grid penalty as well from China so he was just always going to run around at the back of that race it was never really going to be anything he could do from there and um, that car is basically it's it's quick enough that once it's got good track position it can convert that track position but it's not so much quicker than the midfield cars that he can then that any either of them could just blitz through from from the back of the grid so Ricardo had that benefit in the sprint and then Sonoda had that benefit in in the race and Sonoda was excellent in the in in the Grand Prix, I, I think it was um, he proved that China was an aberration in terms of a down weekend for him, 
um, Yuki continues to be really, really effective. And yeah, it was a great it was a great weekend for for RB for the team. It was a complete weekend for the drivers. They just shared the glory. Mm. So Jerry, he's very much still out on Daniel Ricciardo. Obviously, he's got that new chassis as of China and some positive signs. But yeah, wasn't a, a complete weekend from his perspective. Mark, should we move on to Mercedes? Because as ever, we've got to talk about their struggles. Lewis Hamilton was sixth in the Grand Prix with George Russell eighth. Hamilton, of course, was in the wars in the sprint and even within the the fact that it was there were quite a lot of swings with the tyres and that kind of thing, Mercedes seemed particularly prone to that because even <laughs> when it's steady for everyone else, they find ways to fluctuate. Mm. So I guess it stands to reason that they'll be even more prone to such fluctuations. Yeah, we saw it in Q2 where Hamilton went within a, a tenth and a half of Verstappen, th- third quickest, and then did exactly the same... <laughs> Had, had the same setup on the car, same tyres in the Q3, um, was half a second slow. And then he, he tried a, I think, um, he, set, he, he did try a set of mediums at one point, didn't he? I think, I can't remember if he, he put those on first or second in Q3. But anyway, the, the performance was just not there at all. It, whereas 10 minutes earlier it had been. Um, it was never any real prospect of it sort of doing anything to the cars ahead of it on the grid. It was in about its natural grid position. It was um, seventh and eighth. And I think um, in a straightforward running of the race without any incidents, it would have finished seventh and eighth. That's just about where they were. So, um, yeah, the same old problems with the car. And uh, they claim to have an understanding of it now, an understanding of the problem, and that they're flat out making a, a lot of new parts. Um, but it's a it's a familiar song, so we'll have to see we'll have to see how it goes. Yeah, I think it's very very much wait and see with Mercedes because there's been so many full storms and understanding built, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We need to see some fairly uh, clear signs of progress there. Scott, let's move on to Aston Martin now because it was a real struggle uh, for them. Grab more headlines, to be honest, for brushes with stewards than anything on track. Any justification for the complaints or just covering up their disappointing performance? Um, justification from Alonso in the sense that he obviously felt very wronged at the start of that sprint race and um, Hamilton did arrive as Alonso put it like a ball down the inside so I think I can see, I, can, I see justification in what he was saying and his complaints from the sense that he's I think quite right to be was right to feel aggrieved and like the wronged party so I can see why he's then frustrated if he then also feels in a bigger picture of this season and before, like he's being victimised a little bit. We know that since he's come back into F1, he's had a massive problem with the officials and the, the standard of stewarding as he sees it. So I get it. Um, whether I think it's real or not, I uh, know. Um, the the suggestion of you know nationality influencing penalties, I'm actually surprised he didn't get pulled up on it from, mm. from the stewards. I thought, you know, if, do you remember Gunter Steiner last year in, at Barcelona got pulled up for calling them laymen? And he actually just meant it as in they're not being paid. Like he, he was actually like a legitimate definition of the stewards and he got in trouble for that. And Alonso's basically implied that um, they're letting nationality, well, he didn't just imply, he basically outright said it, that nationality impacts their decision making. So I'm surprised he got um, got away with that. But he, um, he obviously... I, I don't think that was very helpful on his part, to be quite honest. I think I, don't, I think that's, uh, you know, there's lots of things you can question the stewarding process about. I don't think that's part of it. And we should also add that uh, in Miami, it was a Singaporean, an Italian, a Barbadian, and an American with the four stewards. And if you go back to the race before, it's a different uh, selection. So, yeah, it's... Uh it, I, I, it's difficult. I can understand why he's annoyed with some of the penalties. I get that, but I don't think that reason holds water. No, I agree. That's what I'm saying. I, like, I get why he's 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 peeved, but um, it doesn't merit what he said. Um, and to give people who want to believe that kind of thing almost like a reason to believe it when Fernando says something like that. So yeah, I, I think that was. Um, uh, I don't think that was necessary, but it was a difficult weekend for them overall. It it looked like um, the nature of the challenges this weekend just exacerbated what we've seen from that car all season, which is that it just seems to use the tyre a little bit more aggressively. And here, I think it just meant that they were using it too hard in qualifying. And um, we've seen before this car is usually better in qualifying than, than the races because of that trait. Um, so then, yeah, then you're just sort of struggling with track position. But I thought um, Alonso actually then typically drove yet another good Alonso 
Grand Prix and on a weekend where it doesn't look like they'll get anything out of it, he comes away scoring points, which is just a very Fernando Alonso thing to do. Cause some controversy, then drive really well. Yeah, he finished ninth, which was about what you could do with an Aston Martin on this uh, particular weekend, certainly with the way the, the race played out. But the final point, Mark, went to Alpine. Finally, it's got a point. How much of Esteban Ocon's 10th place was good fortune? How much was actually symptomatic of a genuine improvement from that team? Oh, no, it, it, it is gradually building respectability. It, 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 you know, solidly qualified in Q2 again. And that was about... The, it's its natural position in the race. It, 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 it wasn't um, that wasn't due to some fluke or some some incidents happening in front of it, and there weren't faster cars behind it. it that, that 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 was that was on merit. That's about where it is. L- lower end points at the moment, and um, Ocon drove well. Pop quiz, Ed. Which are the five drivers that have yet to score a point so far? Uh, the Williams drivers haven't scored. Joe hasn't scored. Gasly hasn't, and neither has Valtteri Bottas. Correct. Five out of five. Well done. Speaking of Valtteri Bottas, Scott, shall we? <laughs> what do you think? I'm not saying I'm not saying I said that to tee this up, but sometimes things line up nicely. So yes, we should. Well, let's head there right now. Welcome to Valtteri Bottas' sympathy corner. Right, Scott. <laughs> can you explain why we're here in Valtteri Bottas' sympathy corner yet again? Uh, well, I'll, I'll deviate from the norm in terms of um, the on-track performance, shall I? And um, maybe he finished 16, so that wasn't that wasn't much fun for him. <laughs> we'll cast our minds back, respectively, to was it Thursday afternoon in Miami when I messaged you and said, "Well, at least we've got an early contender for Valtteri Bottas' sympathy corner this week," because um, he basically um, got annoyed by his own team coming into the weekend. Um, at some point between China and here. Sauber decided to um, axe his race engineer or replace his race engineer um, and Bottas wasn't part of that decision and, and very clearly didn't agree with it based on the, the way he talked about it and his body language in the press conference and he's also he also didn't sound particularly impressed by the um, by the Nico Hulkenberg signing for 25 not necessarily in principle of them signing Hulkenberg but just the timing of it and the way it's been done the suggestion was that Bottas didn't get a huge amount of notice um, before they announced that, and obviously that was that news came only a few days after the Chinese Grand Prix, where Sauber had said publicly that you know they needed to give the current drivers a better car, and that now wasn't the time to decide on drivers. So, if, I think Bottas feels a little bit put out in that team at the moment. And if I was a if I were a betting man, I would suggest that he will not be there next season. I think it's still possible, um, but I feel like he is lower down the team's list and he wants to be and I think they might have just rubbed him up the wrong way and made him not want to stay there anyway. Yeah, I think that's the distinction. I think um before this weekend he he would have his preference would be to remain there and I think now his preference is to go somewhere else. Yeah, which is probably good because I think he was only really in contention as an emergency spare if they didn't get their other drivers uh set. So yeah, interesting to see where Bottas starts uh, pushing for. Obviously, his management have been talking to plenty of people, so he'll be a contender for some drives lower down the grid, I'd have thought. As always, we've dedicated the final part of the podcast to questions from the Race Members Club. And remember, if you'd like to join, you can click the link in the episode description or head to our website and click on Go Ad Free, because an ad-free environment is one of the many benefits of the Members Club. You can also sign up to our Members Podcasts via Apple Podcasts. Mark, the first question to you from Jacobus VDL, who says, very happy to see Norris and McLaren win, but what is it about this rule set or tyres that mean if a car is running at the front, it can run more quickly, even than apparently quicker cars? behind uh the the tires are very delicate and if you get in you know the the dirty air uh then you the, the, you, you start to put more energy in the tires and it, it just it, the, the thing spirals and so you you have a a natural difference between cars performance say if it's two tenths um you can easily have a difference in tyre performance once you've done a few laps with one one car in clear air and the other car in turbulent air of uh, two or three times that. So y- yeah, you can have you can have a situation where an ostensibly slower car is going faster than a ostensibly faster car just through track position, and it, it, it builds. And it, that's that's the point. It, it, that that tyre offset will build. 
yeah, very much a virtuous circle. One of the strengths of Max Verstappen always delivering and pretty much always being at the front. It puts them in an even stronger position. Scott, a question from Freddie C, who says, how much of Lando's excellent win was down to events and how much can be attributed to the extensive McLaren update? There was obviously weirdness in the Miami track, but can we expect more of this from them? It's a good question, this one, Scott, because we haven't talked so much in detail about the upgrade and future prospects, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say I'll focus on more on the update part of Freddie's question as I think the first part was nicely covered by Mark's in-depth explanation of how things played out earlier on. Um, the update was, as Freddie describes it, extensive. It was basically um, tip to tail on the car and also a bit underneath as well as on top. So um, front wing, um, uh, front suspension, brake ducts, uh, side pod inlet, engine cover, bit about the rear suspension as well, and rear wing, I think, uh, beam, beam wing? wing yeah. Beam wing, so yeah, I nearly got it all. That was, uh, uh, gave it a good go, maybe next time. Um, so it it was a lot. Um, it was um, less about um, specifically things like the slow speed corner weakness, which we've talked about a lot before, and that is a, a long-term project. This was part of it, but um, it's, it's going to be a year-long thing chipping away at it and then hopefully the 25 car um, addresses that is essentially adding more load but being a bit more of an more downforce more aerodynamic efficiency um, and that did play a part in the the performance here not um, it wasn't transformative I don't think um, I don't think this circuit gets the absolute maximum out of a, a package like this um, it was less than the Austria and Singapore upgrades um, last season in terms of what it brought the upgrades last season improved the McLaren performance by about a second um, which I think was maybe about four or five temps across each of the Austria and Singapore ones and a little bit from the Baku one at the very start of the year um, this was less in isolation than something like Austria but you're still looking at a, a good gain um, where it played out here is that um, the extra load being produced by things like the floor rather than put in rather than bigger wings um, meant that McLaren was able to to go with its um, low lower drag rear wing for the long straights that we have in in Miami um, without sacrificing too much low speed corner performance which um, dominates a, a big part of the rest of the track and obviously the sweeps in the first sector as well so still had good downforce more downforce than they'd have had before in a lower drag spec so this was a better performing car for this circuit than the predecessor would have been and that is why Lando had a tangible performance advantage over Oscar who had what Zach Brown called the upgrade light version of the car Next up is a question I'll take from Ed R. Gaming, who says, Why didn't Hamilton get a penalty in the sprint race? Even if the Aston Martin's crashing was going to happen anyway, he still seemed to dive bomb in and only make the corner due to Alonso bumping him round. Yeah, it was certainly a misjudgment at the first corner, because obviously if you come steaming up the inside, you've got to turn pretty tightly, and, and he couldn't. It was a slightly less extreme version of the Perez Grand Prix start, but with bigger consequences. Now, Certainly, the level of that misjudgment could put you in contention for a penalty. There were basically two reasons why the stewards didn't. The main one was they considered the whole melee as, as one incident. So actually, if you look at the sequence of events, Alonso and Stroll have a bit of an initial collision. Now, Alonso, with some justification, said that was partly because he was trying to hold it a bit wider because he could see Hamilton coming. So you can argue Hamilton influenced that. And then, of course, Stroll had contact with Norris and... Obviously, Hamilton arrived on the scene. There was contact with a lot. So that sort of melee happened. And the stewards always have to deem whether someone is wholly or predominantly to blame. So their argument was, well, there was this Aston Martin collision happening and there were four cars involved. And therefore, they the, the sequence of events meant they didn't attribute it wholly or predominantly to Hamilton. Rightly or wrongly, that was their view of it. They also noted in their verdict that greater latitude is given to drivers for incidents on lap one first corner. So that, those were the two factors. But it was the fact they conceived of that whole incident as, as one thing and couldn't find him wholly or predominantly to to blame. It was certainly a, a uh, a misjudgment not not great from Hamilton but that's why uh, there was no uh, action taken on that one next up question for you Mark from just another Dutchie in qualifying only three drivers had a slower Q3 time than their best Q2 time what happened in Q3 to make it difficult for Hamilton Russell and Sonoda to improve where others were still able to improve by several tenths of a second do track conditions change that dramatically in a few minutes um, they have done this this weekend around here and the 
tyres seem to be, the soft tyre in particular, seem to be extremely sensitive to um, the, the preparation lap. And just uh, small small differences could get it right out of the window. Then you, you weren't going to get it into the window. Um, it basically, you'd have it... You'd have to drive it extremely slow out lap, or um, you, your rear tyres would be overheating. And I think it's just that it's just some. If you if you get it in the window, you're going to be a lot quicker than someone who's not uh, got it in the window. And sometimes that's not merit. It just happens to be where you are placed in traffic as you as you come out down that, in that pit lane queue, and how how quickly the other car in front of you has to go to to prepare its tyres because each car is different in how they, they, they need to prepare the tyres. So um, a little bit of randomness and a, a little bit of judgment, but that, that that's what it's about. And Scott, next up, a question for you from Yap Rata. He says, where does the limit lie between unsportsmanlike and sportsmanlike behaviour? What is the exact definition? Also, the question of questions, pizza with or pizza without pineapple. I'll do the second bit because that's the easy one. Uh, I don't object on philosophical grounds on uh, to pineapple on pizza although it wouldn't be my first choice. So uh, I'm very neutral when it comes to that one. No, you're wrong. Um, pizza without pineapple. Pineapple belongs on tacos al pastor, not on pizza. Um, so that, <laughs> that can get in the bin. Um, as I should have known you to bring, uh, bring tacos into this. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to take the easy bit of the question, which obviously connects to a certain Kevin Magnuson? It does, yeah. Um, the limit is... It's difficult. It is, well, it's, it is difficult to define actually, and it's it's not something I think you can codify. It's a it's kind of a gut feeling, and everybody I think will judge it slightly differently, which is which is why it's awkward. The um, I tell you where the limit doesn't lie. The limit doesn't lie in backing up a car under uh, backing up other cars under the safety car so that you can double stack at a pit stop. Because if you remember in Canada last year, Norris got a penalty for unsportsmanlike behaviour, and what Norris did in Canada last year was nowhere near as egregious as Magnussen's driving in the sprint. So I, I, they, they, I, I knew at the time in Montreal that by invoking that that wording to be able to pe- penalise Norris, which I didn't have a problem with them doing in principle in terms of wanting to penalise that. That was fine, but that was the way they chose to do it. And I knew when they did that, that would come back to bite them because there'd be an actual moment of unsportsmanlike behaviour that would then be basically compared to that. And it's completely different. Well, now you mention that, actually, I remember speaking to Andrea Stella after the race in Canada, and he was really unhappy with that the whole thing. So that connects to obviously him feeling quite strongly that something should have been done about uh, about what Magnussen did so that all ties together now you uh, bring that bit up yeah exactly and he did say you know he 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 basically said forgive me if I'm upset but this 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 matters because of what happened to Lando last year and, and I do think what Magnussen did on, on in the sprint crossed the line it's just difficult because unsporting in the stewards decision they said that the bar for that has to be really really high so they consider that to be a very very serious offense and it's tricky um, I, I don't think what uh, Magnussen did was right, and I think he's right to be penalised for it. Um, whether it matters, whether you throw around a term like unsporting, I, I don't really know. What I would like to see is what Stella called for, and the stewards have effectively um, uh, agreed with, even though they, they were saying it indirectly, independently of Stella, is that the penalty system needs to be reviewed so that if there are circumstances whereby there are repeat offences like this, the penalty gets larger because there needs to be a really big uh, there needs to be a really big deterrent from doing this because basically one of the reasons Magnussen did this is because he knew he would just get the same penalty over and over again and it wouldn't make a difference because his race was already ruined and the rules the rules shouldn't um, allow or encourage or incentivize that kind of um, that kind of driving whether you consider it unsporting or not. Yeah, I think ultimately you can argue it's perfectly sporting to play according to the way the rules are, are laid out. And if there's set penalties for things that you're going to get, then you can trade those penalties off against gains. And that's the problem I always have, which is why it comes from the problem of having a really set approach to how you apply penalties, because then you can always find circumstances where you can trade those off. So yeah, they need to tighten up a bit more. Question I'll take now from Don Anderson, who says another F1 race with a crash, referring to Logan Sargent and Kevin Magnussen, caused by the unprotected forward surface of the rear tyre. IndyCar fixed this. When is F1 going to fix their most dangerous condition? Well, yeah, obviously that was because the, the front left of Magnussen sort of hooked inside the rear right of uh, of Sargent. And Magnussen, of course, got a penalty for that, his 378th penalty of the weekend or something like that. I didn't count precisely. Now, as it stands, the FIA isn't really intending to tackle that. 
I think there's a philosophical question there because there's a desire to keep it as an open wheeler because there comes a point where you enclose things too much. You could just have a closed body sports car type thing. Now, obviously, IndyCar, for example, Formula E have got uh, a sort of halfway house on that. So it's worthy uh, of considering and it's worth them looking into it. But yeah, in, in terms of when they're going to fix it, there's nothing I've heard on the horizon that they feel that is a particularly problematic thing. Yeah, occasionally that sort of thing happens, but it, it's not considered a, a sort of safety critical thing to to improve. Perhaps it's something we can uh, ask the FI about, but obviously when it comes to tackling things on safety grounds, they tend to have historic data so they can say, look, is this a really, really dangerous thing or is it just a thing that, that creates the odd, uh, the odd collision? Obviously the big question with exposed wheels is launches normally that's the, the big concern so yeah we, we can maybe ask Nicholas Tombasis about whether there's any interest in that or, and if not what the reason is but certainly yeah there, there's no work going on to change this or to, or to fix that as the uh, as the question put it Mark a question from Liam Robinson who says how much downforce did Verstappen lose in his contact with the bollard and did it have a tangible effect on his performance we had a similar question from Mark Malipard I mean you alluded to it and it seemed a bit inconclusive there was something though there, there was some damage there was definitely bodywork damage in the, the rear uh, corner um, and Horner estimated that it would be significant in terms of uh, aero load but they hadn't looked at it at that point um, Verstappen seemed to doubt that. Um, he said there was some damage, but maybe it, it, it had been there before the bollard because he didn't feel the car was any different um, after the bollard incident. And he said he was doing the same times, which you, when you look, he, he was. So uh, a little bit inconclusive at the moment. That's something that uh, we'll typically find out when we, we get to the next race and ask them what they found. Scott, next up, uh, a few Ricardo questions. Lachlan Cowan says, was there any truth to Ricardo's reasoning for his significant drop-off in the second quality session? To me, it seemed that Yuki did a better job on the tyres. Reese Clark asked a similar question. And also, on Ricardo's sprint, William Jenner asked, how was Ricardo able to keep science behind for so long, given the pace advantage the Ferrari has over the RB? Uh, well, on that final point about keeping signs behind, it's a bit like what Mark was explaining earlier, just the nature of um, this circuit combined with um, the nature of uh, this ty- these tyres and, and this car means that if you if you have good pace, which the RB in Ricardo's hands did have versus a quicker car, which had much which did have better pace in in clear air, um, you can pick your moments basically to um, basically strategize your your defense and Ricardo was able to make sure that he had just enough in hand over signs behind I think the Ferraris are also a little bit slow on the straights this weekend yeah. um, which meant that signs wasn't quite as potent um, behind him and also obviously because it being it was a sprint it was over a, a stint rather than if that had been a Grand Prix then eventually um, the pace difference would have would have shown and signs would have um, would have got clear yeah essentially you need typically around a second a lap to be able to overtake so if your car is faster but less than a second faster it's it's not going to get past and as for the um the the other parts of it um i think like i said earlier like ricardo doesn't know what um what caused him to to struggle so much in in qualifying i think and um, there's every chance that sonoda did just prep the tires better um sonoda said that his engineer was actually happy with the tire attempts as they saw them um, in the moment in in qualifying, but obviously that reference could have changed because temperatures were fluctuating and the track uh, surface and conditions were were changing. So I, I just think um, I think he ended up on the wrong side of that um, that sort of razor edge in terms of uh, getting the tyres in the right window. And we've said before, like Ricardo admits it, sometimes he's not um, he's not a, a details man. He's a big big bigger picture driver. Dri- drives with broad brush strokes to. To butcher a little bit of a of analogy, so um, yeah, I just think Sonoda did um, did the better job, just in the same way that Ricardo did the better job the day before. Question for you, Mark, from Stephen Davies, who says, during qualifying, all the drivers decelerated sharply as soon as they crossed the finish line following a qualifying lap. Why did they slow down so suddenly? I would have thought they would keep their speed up so as not to hinder someone else starting a hot lap. Also, Sonoda blocked Sargent severely during the main qualifying session. Why weren't there any repercussions? Um, on the decelerating, I would imagine it's just um, the normal routine, uh, whereby you, you 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 use as little fuel as possible once you've um, completed your your timed laps. 
and so you, it'll just be built into the routine. Otherwise, you, if you, you're you going to go faster for a bit longer, you'd have to put a bit more fuel in, which costs a little bit of lap time. I would think it's as simple as that. What was the second part of the question? About uh, Sonoda being in the way of Sargent in, uh, in qualifying. If you remember, Sonoda was almost stationary when Sargent uh, happened upon him. God, I can't... I've, Got no memory of that whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it 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 was it did seem to be impeding, but it's it's just all balled up in the, the usual problem, isn't it, of the backing up and the, the you know the, the speed differentials are crazy at, at a lot of circuits, particularly these types. It's just... Oh yeah, yeah, it, it yes, it's all tied up as as well in the um, what we talked about earlier and how gentle you have to be on the prep laps. So it's even more extreme. Um, in, in terms of how slow you have to go in, in, in preparing the soft tyre here. And, you know, around, you know, when you've got blind bends and things like that, the, the, the speed differences can be pretty terrifying. But um, it, it's, that, that's what, the, that's what the, uh, the, 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 the race engineers got to be on top of. So, yeah, just one of those things. Yeah, they haven't decided to know there wasn't enough in the way. Probably a little bit lucky to get away with that one, but uh, yeah, perhaps the circumstances played a uh, played a part in that. Scott, a question from Aidan Delahari for you, who says, "How is it that the FIA considered Lewis Hamilton wearing a T-shirt on human rights worthy of being political and being banned, yet allowed Donald Trump to make full-blown speeches? The hypocrisy is mind-blowing. Does this just sum up the FIA not being fit for purpose right now?" A nice, easy question for you there. I'll answer it if it's the last time we ever talk about Donald Trump on one of these podcasts. How about that? I think that's something we'll all very much strive to to uh, to live up to. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, I think it's because uh, well, ultimately, like it's, it's different rules for different situations. The the, the Hamilton stuff is relates to um, what drivers um, can wear and what messages they 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 can spread. It's the same for teams. You can't put that kind of like slogan on your car or or, or whatever. This was a unique situation in which there was um, yeah the uh, uh, truck what. Well, Trump, Trump wanted to be here. There was initially talk of the, like one of his mates doing like a fundraiser at this event and then charging a load of people to be in the paddock club um, to support it. But the organisers killed that dead. Um, and basically, he wanted to be here. F1 were happy to facilitate it. Um, they made the request to McLaren to be the team that he sort of went in the garage with, um, along with um, Ben Salayem at the FAA, and then I think was it um, Greg Maffei at Liberty, I think was with them as well, and Zach Brown, the McLaren racing CEO, um, which McLaren agreed to out of respect to, to, to the office of president. And I know what a lot of people have said on social media and what might, 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 might be jumping to when I say that is, I know that Trump's not the president, F1 knows that Trump's not the current president, McLaren knows that as well. But the office of um, POTUS is sort of something that is like you're you're, you're always you're always a president. The, the, ti- not- the, the, the honorific title is carried over in, in future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're always a president. You're just not the president anymore. Um, although obviously he is trying trying again. So yeah, it's, uh, I'll be honest. Wasn't comfortable with it. Don't didn't 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 really like it. But we have um, politicians and dignitaries turn up at races quite a lot. So I guess you can't. I guess it, I guess ultimately you you can't really ban someone from turning up or or, or whatever. Um, I felt like McLaren maybe would have preferred Zach not to have wandered out into the pit lane and then smiled and um, and had all those photos and maybe Norris got carried away with a slightly overly effusive answer about Trump being there in the press conference as well that he might have regretted afterwards. But ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, that's um, that's not the worst thing that's ever happened associated with Donald Trump, is it? Mark, who was it we un- unexpectedly got introduced to one day in the media centre? Was it the Korean Prime Minister or something like that? Just just suddenly happened? Yeah, it was um, the Korean Prime Minister uh, when we were in uh, the, the Korean Grand Prix. Um, yes, he, he was just brought in by some um, media people for the, at the circuit and a uh, guy in a jacket and tie and uh, we were encouraged to shake his hand and we didn't know who it was and afterwards the media people said it's, it's the Prime Minister. You're, you you um, Ed made um, you were best friends with Vladimir Putin weren't you at the first Russian Grand Prix? Yeah I slightly mistimed uh, using the facilities towards the end of the Grand Prix because the the access route Putin had to get in to go to the podium went through the same entrance we had to 
go through to get to the media centre, so that caused some uh, consternation with various security uh, personnel, so I didn't time that one very well. But that does bring us to the end of the podcast, so thanks very much, Scott and Mark, for your insight. Head to our website, plenty to read there, our YouTube channel as well, all our other podcasts, and of course, we'll be back later in the week, as has now become our new tradition this year, tackling more of the Race Members Club questions because we can never get through them all in the post-race episode. So thanks very much for continuing to send those in. Well, we've got two weeks until the next race, so stay with us for everything you need to know from the world of Formula One. The Athletic.